Well, welcome back to the Graveyard Shift, everybody. I'm Nathan Rouse. And I'm James Pugh. And today we are joined by Business Royalty, um, a man who's been to more networking and business events than any other human. Um, welcome to Richard Sheehan, who's the Chief Executive of Shropshire Chamber of Commerce. Good morning, and thank welcome. you very much for uh, inviting me along. Well, welcome. Richard, look, we called the podcast um, The Graveyard Shift. Uh, we wanted to shift away from this regularly repeated phrase you hear, which says, Shropshire is the graveyard of ambition. So I guess you don't believe that. No, absolutely not. It's nonsense, isn't it? I think there are uh, there are reasons why we're a best kept secret, but um, no, absolutely yeah. not. Uh, that's, that's nothing could be further from the truth when you actually spend time engaging with the business community that we have here. It's fantastic. Yeah, it seems that everybody says it and they get into such a habit of saying it that people go, "We don't want it to be this best kept secret." And I was like, "We'll, st we'll stop saying it." And I think that Invest in Shropshire event that we were at recently was quite interesting because. They're standing up there going, we don't want this to be a best kept secret, so let's stop saying it. And I think that was part of the inspiration for the podcast mm. and for us setting up a web that was specifically designed to drum up business in Shropshire and, and make a big deal about the people that were out here and what was going on. Because there's some amazing stuff. We hear it all the time. We hear these incredible stories, incredible businesses. Um, so it's glad, I'm glad that after, you know, after 15 years of you being at the top before you hand over the baton, that you've got 15 years of, you know, you've been doing what we're trying to do now for 15 years. Um, so over to James. There's yeah. a, we've got a list of merry questions that we'll plough through. I feel blessed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't heard them yet. <laughs> so, no, Richard, let's just sort of start at the beginning, really. If you can just sort of start about your, your career with the Chamber and what the Chamber does. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, as, as has been pointed out, um, I'm 15 years into, into it now. I, I actually joined it for a year as a stopgap job, having spent 26 years in the motor trade and thought I'd just do something different for a short time. So, um, so yeah, I went in uh, for 12 months to, to work on a specific project for the then management team. And um, that was 15 years ago and, and here I am today still, uh, still there. So I think it says something about the organisation um, and it says something about, uh, about the role when people say to me, what, what is it you do? Yeah, what is it you yeah. actually do? What does the chief executive of chamber do? Well, I say, well, it's ne as near to running a charity for businesses as you can right. possibly okay. have. Yeah. It, it, you spend your life encouraging your team to find ways of supporting businesses and helping other companies um, be successful, create economic wealth, and indeed uh, employ people. Uh, and so there's a real sense of well-being around the role itself, uh, and that spreads through the team because they're dedicated and committed to achieving those those goals. Is there a kind of um, you know, other chambers? Do you rank yourself against other chambers? Are there kind of other chambers that you go, oh, we'd quite like, uh, we're a bit better than staffs and maybe maybe Worcestershire, you know, we'd like to... Is there a kind of a pecking order, a hierarchy of chambers? There's a benchmarking okay. system. That's, yeah. that's, we're, we're all accredited by the British Chambers of Commerce yeah. and there is a benchmarking system uh, that measures everything our shoe size and length of your fingernails. <laughs> so you'll always find that you're you're better in some areas than others. Um, I think the the stats can say things that people want them to say. What really influences our, de our decisions about how effective we are is the response from people who deal with us. Uh, and we find an overwhelming positivity towards Shropshire Chamber of Commerce from people who are involved in other chambers we punch well above our weight okay. in uh, in many, many aspects. Uh, and in some cases, we are also a best-kept secret yeah. To, yeah. to our business community, and it is a relentless communication task across a very large geography. Yeah. What do you put that down to, Richard? I, I think there's, there's a lot of different things. The geography is absolutely one of them. Um, I think we see uh, a relentless marketing uh, requirement because there's always a churn of people. Um, our business community is made up 91.5% now is 10 employees and less. Wow. So a lot of people uh, don't have time to get out and about. They don't have time to engage. We're a relatively modest team in terms of size. Um, but so I think there's, there's, a, there's a whole nucleus of different things that come together that, that, that make it a, quite a challenge for us. But one we're up to and yeah. one we're always up to. Quite like that 91.5%. I mean, that's incredible, the number of small businesses here. I mean, is that... 
changed then Shropshire over the years, would you have gone back to the Sankey's days of the 60s and gone, these are huge businesses employing huge numbers of people and therefore you kind of only needed to engage with them on a sort of erratic basis, really, because they were always there. I guess there's 10 employees or less, of which we are one of them, is, in, is, a, is a fluid market, I guess. So it, it, It's a really important market. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, going back going to the original question, the, the, the world was full of big sheds at one time. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I started my working career in one as an apprentice yeah. with Rolls-Royce. Right, and, okay. um, and slowly over time, a lot of those have... have disappeared, have reduced in size. Automation has meant they become a, a, a smaller employer as yeah, such. Yeah. And, and again, over time, we've seen those those businesses, those those smaller employers evolve. I mean, we, we, we sit on over 10,000 sole traders as well across yeah. the across the, yeah. the, the business community. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. But many of them have the, have the potential to become high growth businesses if yeah. indeed they're supported yeah. uh, and engage with. And, and that's something we never lose sight of. Do you think with the pandemic and all the challenges businesses are obviously going through over the last couple of years, do you think the chamber's become more important? Are more businesses looking to the chamber f- you know, for support? Well, it's an, an interesting question um, because I think I'd go back to the recession of 2008 when we saw uh, our membership grow um, every month, our membership grew, Uh, primarily because people needed and wanted to be part of community. They wanted to be part of something. And that was for varying reasons, not least of which almost sometimes the reassurance that what they were going through, others were going through as well. They weren't just on their own. But then it was all about about help and support and how we we give a voice to business because we're there to give a voice to the business community of Shropshire. Um, where decisions are made and stakeholders hide under rocks, yeah. but we, we have that opportunity to 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 get the voice of Shropshire heard. And, and indeed, you know, we're working on a project now, which I hope we can touch on a bit later, which I can uh, explain more about. Right. But um, yeah, I think it's a it's a, an ongoing and always will be an ongoing challenge. Yeah. Mm. There's definitely no hiding under rocks. I think you are the most photographed man in mm-hmm. Shropshire. Um, judging my yeah, <laughs> lots of I, looking I, at social I, or the papers or the magazine. Yeah, um, I, I've, I've seen many of those blown up and put on cars to frighten children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, look, and we, you know, those of us who live in Shropshire and have lived in Shropshire for a while obviously know it's a wonderful county. It's a beautiful place to live, some great places to visit. But what makes it a great place for businesses to invest? How do you encourage people to root and seat their business in Shropshire? Um well, I think the, the, the inward investment challenge is, is again, another ongoing and, and relevant one because um, there's, there's always a danger that you, you, you are overlooked because you are quiet in the marketplace. Yeah. Um, but we have to have, I mean, the ingredients to be an attractive proposition is you, know, you have to have infrastructure. Uh, and we can't kid ourselves at the moment. Our infrastructure is not brilliant. In many mm-hmm. parts of Shropshire, the, the, the broadband... Mobile telephony yeah. is is not what it needs to be for creative businesses such yeah. as this one to be able to set up and thrive. So there's an ongoing yeah. piece of work. And that's why we said don't turn your phones off because there's no point here. No, no, won't no. Get, you probably won't get a signal. Uh, I'm well aware of the mobile phone <laughs> signal in Ironbridge. And, and indeed where I live, uh, uh, much on the, Keeps on the outskirts on their of the tones. county, yeah. same problem. Yeah. But um, we, we need to to demonstrate that we've, we've got transport connectivity. Yeah. You know, we, we, we've skirted around for a long time the, the direct links to London and the value to those. And it was always thought that, oh, well, yeah, we need a light train to London so people can go and have a nice day out. It's not about that. It's about actually getting people out from the southeast and London into this business community to do business, yeah. to find new contacts and new opportunities. So infrastructure is a vital ingredient to supporting the, um, the inward investment that we need. We need affordable housing. We've got quite a bit of it, actually, when you compare our housing market to, to other places. People need to, to understand that they can actually live a quality of life here that perhaps they would only dream of in the, in the city. And, and I'm aware of, of many companies who recruit people from London and the South East on half the salary that they're earning, but actually they've got money left yeah. and yeah. they can buy a house where they're not paying a fortune in rent. Yeah. The quality of life changes dramatically, but we don't do enough to market that particular right, okay. side of, of the opportunity. Mm. And then, of course, there's the, the, 
the big elephant in the room is the skills agenda. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's having those those skilled people um, that businesses know they're going to be able to, to fulfill the workplace. Remote working has helped that in some industries, of course, and some sectors can benefit from from drawing skills from far and wide. And indeed, there are there are some structure-based companies who who over the last two years have been recruiting staff resource from, from around the world yeah. because they can actually work for them remotely. Yeah. Um, so that that's a big one. Um, and, and and will remain a big one because there's no immediate solution to this one. Uh, there's there's work going on, and again, I mentioned a project that we're working on as a chamber. I will come back to that. If, <laughs> it's a good if tease. I'm the opportunity. Every question, so every I, I, is a great really tease. There is a really good project, but I we really, must talk about it because yeah. if we don't, by the end of it, I really <laughs> want to. Sorry, about, about, that's it. Damn it! We <laughs> want to raise your interest, and, and no doubt you'll give me the opportunity <laughs> towards the end. But I think I think the 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 issue around um, it, it's a chicken and egg scenario. We have to retain more of our graduate type educated yeah. residents. A lot of them leave the area and go away to university and they stay away for a period of time. And then we, we see in their 40s and 50s, they come back to beautiful Shropshire, the place where they want to, yeah. to live and work and actually have, enjoy that quality of life. We've got to make it very, very accessible to those people to be here. And so infrastructure, transport infrastructure is another one. You go to a city in a, or, a, or an area that, that usually is surrounded by a university, the, the yeah. public transport is there, it's supported. Here, it's a disaster in, in most cases. You know, and the rural communities are, are, are punished and neglected for being so, and, and that's, that's totally wrong. So there needs to be more work and more investment in, into that as well, so that we've got a, a really good joined up approach to hang on to the people that we've got, further develop the people who are already in the workplace, mm-hmm. um, uh, and free up that, that, that business and development land, because of course the, the building of new facilities, and we're here in this magnificent yeah. uh, old building yeah. today, but a lot of people now, um, younger people in particular, are really, really interested to be working for somebody who has a really strong environmental ethos. And that's right down to the building and the behaviour mm. of the, the, the business itself and yeah. the culture within it. Uh, and, and we know that's now becoming a priority for people as far as recruitment is concerned. Mm-hmm. So we're seeing a situation where we, we have to have that, that new stock of, of environmentally mm-hmm. yeah. uh, unique buildings to, to house these people in and to attract these businesses into because it's so important to them. Now, as an I still think you get those people though that sort of go, well, we quite like shops as it is. Mm. We don't really want it. Oh, Do you know what I mean? It's yes. amazing. I bet loads yeah. of people, we don't want the infrastructure. We quite, we, we love mm. the secret. I mean, I'm a Norfolk boy and it's exactly the same until the A11 got a dual carriageway in the 90s. I mean, everyone's like, Norfolk? I mean, that's like, it could be a different country. Days away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, yeah there, are, there are and always will be people yeah. who like things as they are. Yeah. Um, the, the, only, the only constant is change at the moment and, and you can fight it as much as you like, but it will, it will continue to, yeah. to overwhelm yeah. you in the end and particularly in the climate that we're in and, and where we're headed over the, the, the next few years. So, so yes, there are people who, for whatever reason they have, like things as they are, they have a right to a voice and a right to an opinion the same as everybody else. But if we are serious about growing our economy, growing our employment opportunities and, and improving things like you know, average wages paid in the area mm. and the gross value added that comes from those businesses, then we, we have to be investing in the, these new technologically based uh, buildings and, and facilities and systems. Yeah, just touching on the infrastructure, I mean, things like poor broadband uh, mobile phone signal has been talked about for years. I mean, it must be frustrating for you and the people you speak to who own businesses that, you know, things aren't being solved, you know, issues remain and, you know, we're still where we are 20 years ago, 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah, no, frustrating, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you, you know, you said we've talked about it and we have talked about it and, and they seem to make some inroads into improving it on occasions the providers but uh, it's it's a you know it's a scratching the surface situation mm. it's not a, a real good plan that we need to to improve things because of course yeah again as people want to work from home or set up business in rural communities they need those things as the residents you know residents yeah. deserve to have that as well and um you know it, it's it's a real pain in the Backside. <laughs> that was close. That was close. It was being recorded. <laughs> Almost our first beep. Yeah. Um, 
Who, who's the additional champions then? Who do you kind of partner with to go, come on, guys, we all need to make a noise about this? You know, this is... Yeah, we'll, we'll work with the local authorities because yeah. quite often they have funding um, yeah. and they have they have people within them to... Um, cho- and, and they're working as hard as they can. Yeah. So this is, this is absolutely no slant on those working in that space. This is a bigger problem around the nationalisation of, of infrastructure, I think, and that, that you know, we're in a situation where, where for a long, long time, um, certainly going back four or five years ago, mobile telephony, oh, we've got 95% coverage. But I was the really unfortunate person who drove around those 5% of Shropshire where there was no phone signal. And today, the same problem. I cannot have a conversation on my way to the office. No, join the club. Um, and I, am, <laughs> I am hands-free, so it is legal yes, yeah, uh, at that time. Yeah, so I will emphasize that as, I, as I'm mm-hmm. making it uh, making a point of it. But mm-hmm. um, I, I cannot have a conversation. No. It, you, you just can't. And actually, a lot of people extend their working day and their journeys to work, particularly in rural communities, when it can take you three quarters of an hour to get somewhere and three quarters of an hour yeah. at night. You can you can extend and and do normally extend your your working day by being able to function as you yeah. move. Not here. Mm-hmm. No, most days I have a conversation probably in the car about quarter to eight and it's like, oh, hold on a second, I'm going down Jigger's Bank, I'm going to lose you in the dip. And, uh, you know, I get that. There's a sacrifice, of course, because the county's beautiful, but you just go, gosh, I really could do with having this call before I get into the office and everything then kicks off, you know. It's... There were a lot of conversations around um, the implementation of different frequencies of mobile telephony across the county. Okay. Uh, the emergency services use a particular um, frequency that is specifically for phone calls, because, of course, all our smartphones these days are there designed to download data and, 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 and images and all sorts of things. So, so they need to work on a, on a, a, a particular way that, that a normal telephone, just to make a phone call, yeah. doesn't need to. They also sap whatever bandwidth we've actually got at the time right. massively, okay. particularly on, on masts, where we've now got a lot of withdrawal of masts. We've got a lot of shared masts where where the big providers don't want to pay the rents to, to the, the farmers or the landowners. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I'm as convinced as I can be, purely through my daily operation, that our, our mobile telephony has got worse over the last three years. Wow. Um, and I'm, I'm no doubt because I, I travel the county a lot, as you can imagine, in this role, and it, it's it's just you, it really isn't very good at all. Crazy. So yeah. so there's a massive opportunity, of course. So when you've got a problem, you've got an opportunity, and 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 work is going on. Um, there are there are a number of funding requirements going into government through through UKSPF and others. Where, and there's a rural fund, I think, as well, which is predominantly aimed, I think, at Shropshire because Shropshire council area that is, have a larger geography of rural-based communities than Telford and Reakin, for yeah. example. So I think there's, there's, there's opportunity, but again, it'll never be enough. Mm-hmm. But it is something we should never lose sight of and keep lobbying on and working with in collaboration to, to ensure that we get the very... Yeah, it's a good point, actually. Mm-hmm. There's nothing worse than going on the train and suddenly you get to Birmingham and you get 5G and you're thinking, oh, I mean, it would have been so helpful to have three stops again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, well they by hangs a, a tail in terms of going anywhere on a train at the moment, of course, as well, Yeah. Mm-hmm. which impacts on business. Mm-hmm. We paid for drivers to take us to London and back. I mean, it's, what, 350 quid or something crazy? But then if you a train ticket can cost 200 quid if you're doing it on the same day so you know again they need to because you know we'd love to make the right choice would much easier for the environment if we all go in a tin can on two steel tracks if it's electric yeah but again there lies another challenge <laughs> for the electrification of our lines yeah. and, and, and how we can engage with that but the, the you know like any business when you lose customers it is a long time if ever at all you get them back yeah and people are finding other ways to travel now mm. and um uh, and I say, we're, we're down tomorrow. So if you do need a lift tomorrow, so yeah, just moving on, Richard. Um, obviously, you know, you know, I'd class you as, uh, you know, probably one of Shropshire's uh, well known business leaders. You obviously speak to business leaders, you know, most days, been to plenty of events. You know, what would you say are the um, most important attributes, you know, particularly today to be, you know, a strong business leader? I think you, you've got to have a good pair of ears and you've got to have a genuine interest in, 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 in what's going on and accept the fact that, that one size doesn't fit all. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you, you have to champion the clause. So, you know, we, we are there as a, as a voice of Shropshire business, um, but we do it with research. 
So we do it with information, we do it with intelligence. So what we say, we can back it up because I think that's important. You know, anybody can stand up and say anything and spin a load of yarn, but actually that's no use at all mm. to anybody. So I think I think the the having an evidence based um, focus on on life, I think is really really important. Um, and yeah, you've got, you've got to stand up for business. I, I've come from a meeting this morning where there were a number of areas where I could have been deemed to be quite controversial in terms of how oh, we like that. funding oh. and training, <laughs> yeah. but I can't go into it too much, but I had to have the business voice. Yeah, I had yeah. to put forward on behalf of business something that was probably as near to completely contradictory to the, to the direction of travel that many others were looking to go. Yeah. But it was the business voice. So, mm. so it's having that, that conviction to supporting the business community as well. But leadership in general is tough at the moment. I mean, you you know, we've got some, you know, you get some unicorn businesses and you're reading about lots of the cryptocurrency guys that are kind of going bust or going missing. You've got sort of, um, you know, your made.coms backed by brilliant entrepreneurs spiking in terms of valuation and going bust. But these people seem very authentic at the time. But kind of leadership in business at the moment, I don't think it's ever been tougher because of legislation, because of regulation, changes in working practices. I mean, it feels like a real roller coaster the last sort of two or three years. But do the attributes stay the same for leadership? Is that something that resonates throughout, regardless of what turmoil we're going through? I think the the, the qualities of leadership remain the same. Right, okay. they, they, they don't change. How you adapt to them and how agile you are with mm. those obviously is what what is the key to yeah. to moving forward you know i think the last two or three years have been tough the last 15 years have been tough you know I, i've been involved in in the chamber over that time and the credit crunch as it was termed mm -hmm. uh, and the recession we got hit yeah. by uh, obviously didn't help brexit has been you know that we, we know brexit's had a had a massive impact car crash <coughs> We, yeah. <laughs> we, but, but not in Westminster, apparently. No, no it's, 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 all, well, it's all gone very well. But the, the reality <laughs> behind it is that we are in a situation where the impact on the workforce, particularly for, again, our business sector makeup, where we've got agriculture, okay. yeah. uh, we've, we've, we've got tourism, leisure, hospitality, yeah. all of which were supported by migrant labour massively. You know, yeah. and, uh, and, and that disappeared overnight. The, the government are hiding behind the fact that, uh, oh, half a million people left the workplace during COVID, which was the next little delight that yes. came, came upon us. Mm. And, um, uh, yeah, they did leave the workplace. Um, some of them will come back. I think their relationship with work had changed. They evaluated life and thought, you know what, I, I think I can manage as I am. I yeah, quite like being at home uh, and, and I think I can cope with, with, with less money, but I can get by. Well, of course, the, the inflationary pressures now are going to dictate that for some that won't be possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they will look to, to return to the workplace at a time when we need to strengthen the workforce, but at a time when we also know we are going to be facing some, some very sad failures yeah. in businesses across across our community and that will release people into the workplace as well so so we'll see over over the next nine months a um, a movement of labor that will help the problem but it yeah. certainly won't solve it prior to starting my own business i had worked for the nhs in shropshire and then i'd worked for higher education and when you work for massive organisations like that, you don't really realise what's going on in, in the local community. Um, and particularly when you work for corporate organisations, you're trying to attract people into the, the county to work. Um, it, Shropshire, unfortunately, he does have a bit of a, a reputation aptly named Graveyard for your That's right, yeah, exactly, yeah, you know? exactly, exactly um, the reason. And there was one point where we were actually in the NHS trying to say, um, maybe we should have a strap line, Shropshire, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> um, then we had COVID and everybody thought, well, actually, work-life balance quite enjoyed this. I quite mm. enjoy living in a nice place like Shropshire and then working remotely. And so we started to see that kind of influx of, of people come in. But it genuinely was only when I started my own business that I realised just how many businesses are out there yeah. and how many businesses started in Shropshire and are now, I hesitate to use this phrase, world beating, but they are genuinely world beating. Deborah Mitchell, brilliant example of a businesswoman who started off at a kitchen table in Shropshire, supported by women in rural enterprise, mm. Sawar, which of course started in Harper Adams in Shropshire. So Shropshire has always been a great um, incubator for small businesses, 
a lot of us quite happy to to reach a, a, a sort of small and medium size, but significant numbers just end up growing and, and become world beating. Mm-hmm. It's a good plug for Deborah Mitchell because we've got her come in uh, for oh, a podcast yeah. in January. So uh, she's the most interesting lady. We have to make sure that this one goes out before that. One. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, Jack said it's going to be a, yeah. a, a, a nightmare. <laughs> now, clearly, that isn't a shop traction. No, it's not. No. So you're not from here originally. I'm not from here originally. Do you want the the, the story I tell? Yes, please. Give, yeah. give us give us give us the background. So I I actually met my husband, who is a born and bred Shropshire lad, a Shrewsbury Town supporter, but we won't hold that against. Good boy. Him. And um, we met, and he was working for the NHS, and I was working for American multinationals, and um, I moved for love. So I've moved Aww. over. And I'm here since 2002. So my entire family think I speak with an English accent, and everybody. <laughs> I'm somewhere mid-Atlantic, somewhere from America, but that'll be a convent school education for you. Well, Jack was very excited when I told him that we got an Irish-speaking uh, lady coming in, wouldn't you, Jack? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jack. So you moved over to Shropshire to, mm-hmm. to, to, to be with your husband, and, and mm-hmm. now that you've set, you're settled here... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Love the place? Very much so. I, it, it's It's very strange because... You find um, similarities with Ireland in Shropshire. It's very like the west of Ireland. Um, And Shropshire is very much not what you know, it's who you know. Business connections are a really important thing in Shropshire, in a good and positive way, not in a sort of, oh, well, we couldn't possibly give you business because we don't know you. Um, Business recommendations are fantastic in Shropshire. And Shropshire is the very definition of buy local. Um, When you look at all of the businesses, Newport, you know, a sustainable, fair trade, buy local town. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And that's replicated right around the county. Um, And there was a business networking meeting I went very early on when I started the business up and it was in Oswald Street. And this uh, German lady was having a chat with me and, and she owns a business there. And she said, but of course, you're not from Oswald Street. And I said, well, no, I'm, I'm from Shrewsbury up the road. And she said, yes, but we, we like to try and deal with Oswald Street businesses. And I'm thinking the irony of this woman from Germany, me from Dublin. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, but we like to buy local. 16 miles yeah, up the road, I can't absolutely. be. Absolutely. <laughs> and we were totally in with the whole idea of we must buy locally. Fantastic. You know? And that's great because, of course, all business is local. Everything is, all politics are local. Everything is local. Absolutely. And it's it, it's very important to Shropshire business, I think, that they um, not only speak about giving back to the economy, but are seen to be giving back to the economy. Does that have a, is there a problem, a, a potential problem of that then becoming too insular though and, and, and looking too much locally or... or... Does that not bear out? So back to the whole graveyard of your ambitions. Exactly. And this is where you yeah, go exactly, to retire. Yeah. yeah, I think traditionally, and I'm, I'm thinking back to my NHS days, it was always very difficult to try and keep young people in the county, very much so. Um, and, you know, the Chamber of Commerce and others have done fantastic work around apprenticeships, Telford College, Shrewsbury Colleges groups. The, the amount of apprentices uh, programmes on offer are fantastic. I think if there was a observation rather than a criticism because it's 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 very difficult to be all things to everybody when it comes to infrastructure but i do think public transport is a is a bit of a challenge i think yeah. Yeah, a lot of people would um, agree with you on that. and it's you know it's it's by definition a rural county it's yeah. the largest ca- rural county in the country so it is difficult to get from a to b and um public transport hasn't c- quite kept up with um where people feel they need to be for home and then work. Not everybody wants to live above the shop. So I I do think that's a challenge. Um, But having said all of that, businesses are very good about trying to give attractive offers to to keep people in the county and keep young people in the county and make sure that they they can see their career developing in the county. Do you think it's becoming easier to convince the young people to stay? Well, I look back at, at, you know, when I was 18 and 19, which, as my nieces are fond of saying, in the last century. um, And I think most people do want to have a chance to try something new elsewhere. Um, Gap years weren't around when I was in in school. You you went to school and you stayed in school and that was it. But, you know, I think a gap year is a good thing. It gives people an opportunity to have a look. I think if there is one thing that Shropshire Business can do Mm. to to try and persuade young people to stay in the county is to give work experience. We've given work experience, you know, and I'm a small business and, and 
two of us work from home and one has a uh, works from an office. Um, and if I can give work experience to somebody or a, a university placement student, then anybody can. You know, and you look at what I do, I'm constantly out with clients, a lot of confidential stuff, but it's about prepping the client and saying, you know, would you be okay if somebody sat in on the meeting so that they could see what and it's do, like. And do you find that the, the, most people are willing to have somebody sat Absolutely, in? Absolutely, but they think they can't do it. Hmm. They they assume that there's going to be a lot of barriers in yep. the way. Um, and work experience is, is one of the best ways because, of course, it introduces young people to the world of work, which is totally different to going to school, yeah, let's face absolutely. it. Um, but it also then, right back to where you started off with, it exposes them to the number of businesses that are in the county. I mean, you know, at, at one end, outside Whitchurch, you, you've got like a world-leading equine insemination yeah. centre. And then right down at the other end, you've got Foodie Heaven in Ludlow. You know, and everything in between. So there is literally something for everybody. And the more businesses that that sort of say, come along, have a week with us, have a couple of hours, have a morning. That's sometimes all um, young people need is just, oh, well, I didn't realise it was going to be like this. Yeah. Um, lead us on to a bit more about your business. Um, is it fair to describe you as a problem solver for businesses? We are. Um, it, it started off as that. It started off as, you know, this is how you deal with a disciplinary. This is how you deal with a, a, a grievance. And, you know, there will always be that kind of stuff. And of course, the bread and butter stuff that people hate doing, like the policies and the procedures and the contracts. A lot of my work now, surprisingly, is much more about um culture within organizations and helping managers manage people because of course in a big corporate everybody's idea is well HR are there to manage all the difficult people and I as a line manager I can be the person who tells them they were marvelous whereas actually being a line manager is very difficult you have to do all the good and the bad and performance management isn't just about the poor performers it's also about how can I retain the really good performer so a lot of our work now is is far more about um, helping line managers develop those skills that said, we've got a shed load of disciplinary <laughs> grievance work on at the moment. You know, it just it swings around about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you talked about this um, off air before we started, but you know, why are there more? Why are you dealing with more grievances in the workplace? And I, I genuinely have thought about this because you know, you do. It, there is such a thing as the effect of the full moon. You do actually see the effect of the full moon. Christmas is. Um, Always a busy time for HR. The, the bit between Christmas and New Year, after the Christmas parties have happened and everybody has stored up all the fight that they want to have and then it all comes out in the pub at the Christmas party. <laughs> that, you know, that's why Christmas and New Year that's is the worst time. That's why we didn't do a Christmas time. party. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I'm delighted <laughs> because, you know, it is a work event. Um, but I, I do think there is something in the fact that for the best part of two years, people lacked that day-to-day -day interaction with other people. Um, and, you know, your family kind of have to put up with you. If you're in a bad mood, your family have to, you, you know, you're married to them, you're living with them, you're stuck with them. Um, your work colleagues are different. Um, and I genuinely think people have forgotten how to behave in work. And on the other hand, line managers sort of majorly overreacting with simple things like, you know, can you put your phone down now because we're actually in a meeting. And people have forgotten that they are in real time and can be seen. So things that they would have been used to doing on Zoom are really not appropriate. Yeah, in so work looking situation. at the screen with yeah, your phone sort of yeah, down yeah, by absolutely. your legs, so texting your mates while you're... Yeah. Well, quite likely looking at something else rather than just well, occasionally <laughs> not doing yeah, on the absolutely. Zoom. We've all done that with the camera off. So, you know, I think it is that honest to goodness, day-to-day -day interaction with other people. And we're very quick to take offence. We're very quick to take offence and we're not so good about reading the room and understanding, you know, banter maybe has tipped over into something else. And, and, and we're doing a lot of and that. And does that bring you back to what you were saying about doing a more work around culture? Because I mean, that, that sort of Huge. became a buzzword, hasn't it, in the last sort of few years? I also uh, worked in the NHS in Shropshire, uh, and of culture is a big thing that they're they're trying to sort out. And it, is that something that the more businesses are are looking inwards and thinking, okay, it's not just about ABC; yeah. it's about the overall culture. Yeah, yeah, and and um, a lot of that 
stems from businesses wanting to be more inclusive. Absolutely. So, you know, not just diverse and equal, but actually inclusive, being a welcoming place for for people who don't necessarily look like me, sound like me, um, have the same values as me. You're just as valued in my organization. And I, I think that's that's a really good sea change for for businesses. Um, but I think in a in a sort of a challenging way, being a very large rural county, we don't have the same kind of diversity of um, people that we would maybe in Birmingham, for yeah, example. absolutely, yeah. Um, and so I, I can see how businesses are really trying very hard to attract and retain people who are different. Um, and by that, I mean different from the way that they would have set their business up and be more inclusive and are, are really struggling to attract and retain um, people to the organisation. But I think it's a very important conversation to have because um, I was talking to somebody last week and, and of course, with the documentary on Netflix that we won't mention, but that particular <laughs> But a lot of stuff has come out of that, that, you know, HR people, independent mm. HR people, as well as HR people in, in corporate, I've been talking about for years, things like unconscious bias. You know, you, you will recruit people that look like you and sound like you, and you will make instant judgments based on someone's CV, the sound of their name. So, you know, it, it's about being aware of that. Mm. And that's something we're ending up doing quite a lot of. And, that, and I think that that's an important conversation to have. And at what stage then does a business sort of get you involved? Do they, do they sort of already have an issue before they come to you or do they come to you from the, from the start? How do, you, how do you get ingrained in, yeah, into a business? I, I think you know the answer to that. It's, <laughs> it's, it's usually, we've had a tribunal claim. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 it's a good mixture of people who, who come to us with a specific problem and it's, it's a bit of a piece of project work and we, we have a look at that for them. Um, we had, particularly when I was starting, um, there were a lot of startup companies who were looking for the basics, policies and procedures. Um, and I love those clients because they're the clients that you started with when they were starting. So you know about them and you've, you're have you almost a, a part of their team. You know, if they ring up and say, well, I've got a problem with James, you know which James they're talking yeah, it's, about. It's, so it's, we can, it's, yeah, similar, yeah. it's similar to yeah. the way we approach things. It's, but yeah. you, you don't want to be seen as the company that does this bit for my company. You yes. want to be seen as part of yes. that business and, and people know you as yeah. their HR, yeah. not. Yeah. And in a strange way, it, it's good if clients sort of we only ever touch base with them once a month and see how things are going because you've almost done your job right you've got them you've give, you've given them the confidence to actually deal with those little problems because you know every every disciplinary and grievance is huge if you've never dealt with one before every investigation is terrible of course if you've yeah. never done one before every interview is awkward if you've never done one before um we want to make sure is that they don't get complacent about it. So we do touch base a lot with our clients, just, you know, how are things, how are things going and so on. Um, and a lot of our clients use us now um, in their development plans going forward. So we're thinking of restructuring, we're thinking of um, expanding. You know, they will have proper conversations with us right at the very beginning. So we're we're their HR department where we just happen to be outside we're yeah. not we're not in the business and there's a lot of benefit in that because first of all we don't cost as much as someone on online um but secondly we do bring an external view and a lot of the time um particularly with farming clients uh, of all people because a lot of them have um employees that are with them 30 or 40 years those are quite literally different types of employment law um, and so you're bringing the knowledge from one client to another knowledge and you're sharing it across the county. So it's a, it's a good thing. Um, would you say that sort of the pandemic has caused more businesses to come to you for advice? You know, and what, what are they coming to you for, asking for? In the beginning, it was furlough letters. Yeah. Absolutely. Nobody knew what furlough was. No. Um, and it, I ended up sort of sending out quite a lot of uh, quick chatty, don't panic, we don't know either, but here's what we think it is, emails to, to clients. And then they sort of spread out around the county. And at one point, there were like 15,000 businesses were getting these little snippets from me. Going, okay, <laughs> wow. this is how you spell furlough. <laughs> this is what it's going to be. Um, and, and nobody knew how to pronounce it for no, a start, course. you know. So then, You must be used to people not knowing how to pronounce with, with your with, I with answer your to anything. I literally <laughs> answer to anything. And I don't let it worry me because it, it is, it looks, it's nothing like it's spelt. Um, so yeah, furlough letters were the ones where it started. Um, and then we had that little dip where uh, people weren't 
sure were they able to carry on because they, you know, and, and fair dues to the government because they didn't have to put it, their hand in the pocket mm. as much as they did. Mm. Um, and so there was a significant amount of support. Um, I think once everybody sort of realised what they could do and don't panic, don't make any hasty judgments, most businesses were able to keep going. There are certain pockets that have really, really struggled. Hospitality. Um, and, and that wasn't just COVID. That was also um, a significant number of their part-time or casual worker staff left the country, essentially, um, you know, because of Brexit and then also because of COVID. Following on, though, from that, um, those businesses that did manage to weather the storm more or less used up their reserves. And then when we had the cost of living crisis, they've literally no pot to go back to. There's no little magic money tree, as a a minister once said. Um, And that has proved very difficult because most businesses do want to do the right thing for their staff. Of course, businesses are in business to make money. We're all in business to make money. Otherwise, we can't live. And, you know, there's there's no point being coy about that. Um, But you want to do the right thing by your staff. And the trouble is, if you've got five staff, all of whom need a pay rise, but your budget will only allow you to do it for four, that means you're going to lose someone. And that's a very difficult decision for a business to make. And that's where we end up having those conversations. Particularly, I suppose, with a small business as well, Mm. because Mm. it's... feels more personal, I guess, oh, when, it's a, when it's a smaller business. Hugely, hugely. And 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 that's a whole set of problems in itself because when uh, somebody sets up a small business, they go on personal recommendations, they, they hire their friends, their mates, and then if something difficult happens, it's very difficult to have a conversation with, your, with the person you see as your best friend rather than your employee. The flip side to that, though, is, um, you, you know, with all of the, the challenges around cost of living and so on, the busiest time that any of us in HR uh, department land have ever had was the last recession because people like me, and, and I'm genuinely saying people like me who were made redundant, may have um, been given a redundancy package, did their sums and thought, actually, I've always wanted to go into business for myself. And that's exactly what I did. Mm. That's exactly what I did. And, and we're starting to see that a lot of small businesses starting up. A lot of people thinking, well, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. And, and off they go. And it's it's great to see because it's that kind of entrepreneurship will help us move out of, of recession and growth. Way to start our podcast. We've never done that before. No, it's a first. <laughs> it's a first. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely musical introduction. Uh, Tony Wright, we begin by asking about your passion for music. Um, when you're not speaking on stage, you're performing on stage. Uh, how do you blend your musical background with you know your business world? Yeah, that's a really good question because uh, when I was going through college and university, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew I really loved music. I loved playing. I was doing shows and orchestral stuff. Um, But I I didn't really see that as my actual career. So I did a business studies degree. And at the same time, I carried on doing all of my music. And I started doing shows at things like, do you remember the old musical in Shrewsbury? Oh, yeah. You certainly do. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, you know, proper old school uh, before we had Theatre 7 and just started from there. So um, I went into the world of IT, um, so started off as a software tester, and then I'm now actually running my own IT business with my husband. But alongside all of that, I've carried on with the music. So I play with the Birmingham Philharmonic Orchestra. I play in a lot of musicals around the Midlands. Um, I do a little bit of teaching to give back, to try and excite kids into music. And then one day I was thinking about um, the skills that I've learned through playing and being a performer. Former. And I thought, is this why I'm quite comfortable speaking and being in front of people? It's because I've been used to doing concerts and performing. Sure, yeah. So you, you, you're up there with people looking at you yeah. anyway. And that sort of made me think about, um, you know, there's a lot of focus and education about the STEM subjects in English and maths, which I agree are really important. But I often feel like the arts are being squeezed and almost like played down. Whereas to me, I feel like this is where you get 
kids really shining, being creative and developing those entrepreneurial skills. Things like, you know, listening, speaking, confidence, thinking outside the box. And actually, when you're running a business, those are the skills that you want. You don't want Absolutely. little yeah. robots, do you? You want them to be able to think. Well, it's so- quite interesting because there was a study which I was looking at yesterday, which uh, the Times reported on, which was, which was about sport. Uh, in school and and how that's been shown, which I think everybody knows, but you know, it's almost you almost need sort of a bunch of academics to come along and tell you that they've proven it. You know, the, the whole healthy body, healthy mind thing, and they they have proven that the that, that kids who do marked amounts of sport at school see an upturn in their mental health. Uh, and you know, th- there's so many studies that link music to mental well-being as well that, that it seems crazy to then cut the budgets for that in education. Yeah, absolutely. And um, this is why I've got involved with the Federation of Small Businesses championing things like skills. And I'm always talking about arts and creative, even though I'm running a tech company. And yes, digital skills are vital. I want to push that real arts and creative agenda. So I did the TEDx talk and I was talking about why I blend those skills with the business world. And I touched on things like that study about, you know, there's scientific studies showing that students that play an instrument, actually do better in English and math. So why are we trying to push it out the way? But it's also used for uh, rehabilitation as well. So, you know, patients that have had brain traumas or have been in comas, music actually helps them recover. It helps with cognitive function. It helps with sort of uh, your uh, fingers and your coordination skills. So, you know, it's just got so many benefits. Um, um, Lisa Song, um, nicely, um, you mentioned it um, just. Um, your role with the uh, FSB um, put you in a p- perfect position to comment on, you know, Shropshire's fantastic mix of small businesses um, and why Shropshire is a great place to do business. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's so many um, small businesses just doing amazing things. And, you know, the economy is made up of like 99% of small businesses. And, and often when you go to these like big government things, it's all about cornerstone employees and big employers. And I'm like, yeah, but what about that person? That's doing amazing stuff with artificial intelligence. And they're a small business in Telford. Um, so I find it a really vibrant place. And I really like the way that Um, The FSB gives uh, business owners opportunities to champion various different things. So they have various different policy champions and all sorts of different subjects. Um, So the one that I'm leading on nationally is skills and apprenticeships. So the next minute, as soon as I took the role on, I'm I'm leading a a conversation with the Treasury and the Department of Education. We're talking about, you know, what it's like to have an apprentice and go through all the paperwork and the hoops they make you jump through from our point of view. Mm. And I was giving them all these examples about, you know, uh, um, where their website doesn't work and the process you have to go through. And they were like furiously writing it all down because they're, they're so in it. They can't see. The, yeah, you, the you, have to, you have to have the lived experience. Don't you? Yeah. We, I mean, we've been through it last year. We, we tried to bring an apprentice on board and in the end it, it, it fell down because the, the process itself was arduous anyway. Um, and then we got right to the sort of final bit and, and the person who was going to come decided they didn't want to anymore. But I think probably because it had taken so long. Yeah. Um, but as you say, they're so involved in the, the the doing that they don't see the impact it has on the people who are actually trying to, to land the thing. Absolutely. And, I, you know, I was given the example of, you know, you have to create a gov account for this. You've got one for business rates, you've got one for the valuation office, one for apprenticeships, one for this, that and the other. And when you're trying to access all these different things, none of it talks to each other. And then you'll get a random system generated email, which makes no sense. And I'm like, <laughs> so um, it was a really good conversation. But the FSB opened those doors because, you know, they see the value in things like skills and apprenticeships. And one thing we're looking at at the moment is things like T-levels, which I think is a great way of um, actually getting students real life work experience. Because when you do a T-level, you have to do 45 uh, days in a business, which I think is brilliant because it actually gets them into whatever the industry is and seeing how it operates, not just, you know, reading bits of paper. Yeah, and, and uh, again, you know, there's plenty of people out there who aren't academic uh, yeah. as such, but but have other skills which, you know, are beneficial to businesses. Yeah. But if they're only going down, if they've been pushed down the academia route, yeah. then they might not get the chance to shine. And certainly when I was at school, I mean, it was last century now, but um, <laughs> they, they, they were... They oh, were, <laughs> It was, yeah, they were very much like university was the golden yeah. boot and that's what you had to do. And apprenticeships were almost kind of dumbed down. Whereas Absolutely. now, as an employer, I'm almost saying 
actually, I think I'd prefer an apprenticeship because you get in quicker and you start learning, especially in digital. You know, by the time they've written a curriculum, it's out of date. There's new languages that have come out. There's new ways of doing things. I, I, I guess with, with an apprenticeship as well, you, you get that um, sense of loyalty almost, I suppose. If you're, if you're taking somebody through an apprenticeship, then at the end of the day, you're investing in them, but they also feel invested in, so they want to stick around at the end of their apprenticeship and, and you've got a ready-made oven-baked employee that you've created. Absolutely, yeah. So we partnered with Telford College, who were brilliant. They did all the sort of screening of the applicants. Um, they showed us how to access the levy, um, did all the paperwork. Um, I found it really, really easy. And our apprentice has just finished her apprenticeship, and she's now looking at the next thing that she could do, and we've offered her a full-time role with us. You know, it's just a lovely story. And um, she even won the Apprenticeship of the Year with them. So brilliant. we were just, like, almost so emotional because it <laughs> It was just so lovely to see where she'd come from and where she's now at. Well, and I guess it must be a sense of pride because although obviously it's down to her hard work, some of it's got to be down to you guys and, and the support that you've given and, and, and what you've taken her through. Absolutely, yeah. And, um, you know, both Alex and myself, who are directors of Purple Frog, um, we've come from big business and, you know, we're so grateful for the experience we have. But what we've done, we've taken the best bits of big business and implemented it into a small business. And one of the key things that I was very passionate about was creating the right culture. So it's where we really look after the staff. Um, we encourage a learning culture. We give them dedicated time to go off and just study and learn about about new things, exciting things. We ask them to be STEM ambassadors. We ask them to go and do school talks. And, you know, I'm always promoting that uh, work-life balance as well. So I'm letting them know when I'm playing music and, you know, trying to encourage them. Whatever it was they were good at, you know, don't let that drop. Um, and I think that's why I also got involved with the Tech Timeout initiative that Steph Henson's running, because I think that's brilliant. You know, it forces you to take tech time out of your business. That's really sort of... Um, gathered some momentum, hasn't it, the tech time? It has, yes. Yeah. She, she approached me quite early on um, about becoming an ambassador, and I'd literally just done my TEDx talk, talking about that, you know, over digital overwhelm, because so many, um, not just students, but adults, it's almost like the curse of the red dot when you pick your phone up and you've got so many yeah, Well, I'm sitting, I'm sitting here now and I've got my phone right next to me. Yes. Um, and you're right, you know, I'm sort of keeping half an eye on it to see if it starts flashing at me. Yeah, and there's a lot more anxiety in the world. And I think it's because of these smart devices and social media, it's exacerbating that. It's making us form an addiction to our smartphones. And then I started researching it and they actually design our phones to keep us on them. It's part of it. It's mm. called persuasive design. So, you know, when you like you pull your screen down to refresh, you're getting fresh content. When someone's typing, you see the three dots going up and down. That's creating a stress response in you. And you you stay online to see what they're going to yeah, type. Yeah. So the whole design of the phone is made just to make you stay on it, and it's not good for us. I suppose it goes back to your sort of music, interest in music as well. That you know, I'm sure you'd rather be playing music than spending sort of the time on your phone or a digital you know, device. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it gives me that break, you know. So um, when I'm, you know, not in the office, that's where I love to be. I love to be performing and playing, and, and that gives me that rush of endorphins. Yeah. And what's your background? Are you sh Shropshire born and bred or have you come into Shropshire and found Shropshire at a later date? What's yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an alien, but I'm not far <laughs> away. I'm, I'm from Worcestershire. Huh? Um, so, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll allow it. <laughs> yeah, so I was about 10 miles away from Shropshire. And then I moved to Shrewsbury um, in the 90s and then met my husband who's always been in Shropshire. So, yeah, I, I kind of consider myself from Shropshire now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned um, a lot of businesses are having sort of recruitment issues. What other sort of issues are you finding businesses, you know, are having? And yeah, so other things are like, you know, excessive energy bills. Um, so, you know, ours tripled last September. Um, we have had the relief applied now, but I don't know how long that's going to last for. We're waiting for the new announcement now, aren't we? Yeah, so, so you know, they're, they're being hit by costs all over the place. There's the cost of fuel, um, you know, so employees really struggling to actually get around. Um, I saw over the Christmas period um, there weren't enough charges for cars, so people were queuing all down the road to try and charge their electric wow. cars. So it's just there's so many costs being thrown at people and... Um, 
our um, offices were being revalued for their rateable value. So um, I think we were just under the small business rate relief. And then we've had a, a message saying, oh, now you're just over. So you can't apply for that now. And I'm like, have you just pushed yeah, us just, over? Yeah. So How's we that can't happened? apply yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of challenges like that being thrown at businesses. And have you found that um, because of all these issues, more businesses are coming to you know yourself you know for help? Yeah, uh, actually, COVID was really interesting for us because because I think like Sainsbury's would never expect just to stop and not be trading or big businesses use the opportunity to digitally transform. So they were turning to us to say, yeah, you know, that massive piece of work about data analytics and moving everything into the cloud and uh, let's look at machine learning. We we can do it now because everything's turned off. And uh, so we were really busy because of the area we were in and so many companies were using it as the opportunity to do things that they literally said they didn't have time to do before. I know it's, it's interesting because you, you see it with sort of so many things, but all, as terrible as COVID was, it provided, like you say, a lot of opportunities for businesses to do things they probably should have been doing anyway. But yeah. as usual, the day job got in the way and they didn't have the headspace. That, so then COVID came along, they were forced to do it. Have, have most of them kept that going or some of them sort of reverted to type and gone, okay, we did that. It got us through the pandemic, but now we're back. And so we we don't need to worry about that anymore. Or is it something that that they've kept going and and transformed? Yeah, it's definitely transformed and kept going. Um, I mean, most of our clients are big business that they've had to because the infrastructure you put in place and the licenses and everything, you, you couldn't really roll it all that backwards, but it gives them so much more power. So if you think about the amount of data, like banks have got, it's like terabytes, terabytes, well, you know, I can't even say the word. It's, so much data they've got but when you're trying to run systems that have like overnight cycles and then you want to do sales reports the next day um if it's all sort of on prem which means it's on site on physical servers you you're down to how fast those servers can run whereas if it's in the cloud you can just keep throwing extra virtual machines on it so your reporting all of a sudden goes to seconds so all those people that were spending hours doing data entry or waiting for a report to generate they've suddenly got it at their fingertips and they can be a lot more strategic because they can make those decisions faster. Sure. And you think about transactions going through shops, for example, historically, you'd have to wait till the next day to find out what you'd sold. Now you can see it in real time. That store's just done that. Those transactions have gone through. We need to restock and you you can already start, you know, yeah. that whole so, cycle so, so, quicker. So it's, it's slickens up like the whole the whole process of the, of the business, not yeah. just an area of it. it, it it flows through the business. It flows through everything. So, yeah. And, you know, systems that don't talk to each other when you've got like HR using their database and you've got accounts using Sage and, you know, all these systems don't talk to each mm. other. This is where a proper data analytics solution can really help with that. Um, I think I've read that you've um, spent more than 5,000 hours on stage speaking to audiences across the UK. You're obviously here on our podcast today. Yeah. Uh, so you're the perfect person to ask, what makes a great speech? Or or, or how we can do this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I think it comes down to um, like a good story and and the way that you tell it. Um, So I think it's not just about the good stuff, you know, you've got to have show that you've been through some sort of learning and and how you've changed and adapted and evolved. And then I always try and leave audiences with something that they can go and look up or some kind of quick win or something that they can go and implement. So whenever I'm doing a talk, I want them to feel empowered that they can actually, this is what I've done. You can do that as well. It's it's not hard. Let's break it down. Um, So that's how I approach it. Earlier this week, we visited the Shropshire Business Festival. The event took place at Regan College, showcasing the best of Shropshire's businesses and entrepreneurs. Here we sat down with Beth Heath to discuss the event and why she was passionate about setting up a place for business owners to network. I'm delighted to be joined by organiser Beth Heath. Welcome. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Um, Yeah, we're quite excited to be here as well. So first ever Shropshire Business Festival at Regan College and it is looking, if I'm allowed to say this, pretty epic. (laughs) Now, obviously a lot of businesses and a lot of business events um, networking events, they're all known to sort of be a bit boring, a bit the same, same people. Um, you're obviously, your title's the director of fun. Is that sort of the key message you wanted this, to make business events? But, yeah, fun? so yeah. the idea behind this was really that when I go to business networking, I get 
you're right. I see a lot of the same people who are absolutely amazingly lovely people, I hasten to add, but there are a lot of the same people, a lot of the same faces, and I'm going to network, which means I want to meet new people, yeah. and the best way of doing that is in a relaxed environment. I'm not a suit type person. Yeah. I'm much more of a hoodie and jeans and a relaxed environment. I'd rather be playing basketball with somebody um, on a big inflatable or <laughs> axe throwing than I would standing there. I've got a bit of imposter syndrome, like most people have, and so you don't want to walk up to people. The idea behind this was to give people a booklet when they walked in and to make them walk around everything so that they would actually interact with people and they'd have a reason to. So if you could walk up to somebody and say, will you help me fill in my sticker book so I can go get my free donut by talking to me for five minutes, then you're much more likely to meet somebody new than you are. 20 years on in Shropshire, I still go to the same people who feel safe when I go to a networking event. I need, people need a reason to meet new people. Of course, yeah. And how long in the planning has this event been? Obviously, you organise uh, you know, a lot of events and festivals across Shropshire. Yeah, so this was, my team were absolutely cross with me about this festival. <laughs> so in January, when you run an events company, you're a bit quieter. Yeah. So at the end of January, I slept quite a lot. Hibernation <laughs> finished. As we all do, yeah. As you do. And then I kind of went, you know what? Actually, end of March seems like a lifetime away. Why don't we do business festival this side, side of summer? So we spoke to Reakin College, who were up for the idea and said, but that is only six weeks away, Beth. And I was like, that's ages that's like you know it's more than a twelfth of the year um, <laughs> so that is a long long time away so I reckon we can do it and here we are we've done it <laughs> wow I thought you I was expecting to say oh, 12 months two years in the planning then. yeah well most things we do we obviously are running 12 months in advance yeah. always but there is the occasional curveball otherwise I think that your staff get too complacent I mm. <laughs> think they know what's going to happen next week so we often will start a new business or think of something cool and the issue is if you don't do it fast somebody else will do it first yeah um and i just kind of think that if you've got an end point you just work harder and faster to get there yeah so if the end point is a bit shorter then you just work a lot harder and to be fair with this one we've had some amazing truly amazing Shropshire businesses which have we've known for years because I've met them at networking um, and they have said actually yeah we'll come on board as well and I probably I wasn't expecting as many of them to have as much faith as they seem to which was really heartwarming from our perspective but also makes it a better event of course and why Reakin College it is the most unknown business location they've got an amazing business school uh, which obviously is producing amazing students through it and then future workplace we've got to think as a business community that we need the people of the future and Reakin College produces some yeah. amazing amazing future employees for all of us and actually if you can have some input into a location that is an educational establishment and say this is what we need this is what we actually need for our future employees then and those students also get to see a little bit of that as well then I think we all end up with better staff in the future it's got the facilities that we need for seminar spaces but it's also got two huge sports hall one of which we're sitting in right now I like things that are not marquees because yeah. I don't have to build them they've got proper walls and we've got heating and everything that's amazing and it's a bit in my windy world. you are not scared of them blowing down <laughs> no so on Saturday when we were putting up the teepees and it was peeing it down with rain yeah. and super windy I could I think that Reakin College this is a request for them need more buildings <laughs> yeah. so we can put up more things for business festival 2024 yeah so well, that leads me on to my next question. So you're hoping to make this an annual event, are yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, this will hopefully, as long as Reakin College don't hate us after this, <laughs> this will become an annual event in the calendar. So many people have said to me, I hadn't realised it was going to be so big. Yeah. Therefore, can we get involved next year? Absolutely, 100%. If you're listening, get in contact. You can 100% get involved next year. The more businesses we have here, the more fun it makes it for everybody. Yeah. Um, one of the prerequisites is I absolutely hate pull-up banners. You have to do stuff if you come. You know, we've got people writing letters to their future selves. We've got all sorts of really cool stuff happening here. You know, office chair racing, axe throwing, you know, driving a lorry. If I meet a new business and I really want them to get involved, it's all about let's think outside the box. What could you actually do? You know, you could be an amazing PR company and have a podcast that you could bring along. You know, mm. There's all those different <laughs> things that you could do. Yeah. And I would say to any business that's out there, if you do do something like this, whether it is one of the more standard networking things or ours be different don't just have win a bottle of champagne by putting your business card into something people want to make memories we're all yeah. about making people smile and making memories that's my company um aim each year is to make a million people smile and and that is about making memories because people remember our business then yeah 
if you've got a pull-up banner, nobody will remember you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the lesson of the day? <laughs> <laughs> and just on the Shropshire business community, um, I've been involved um, through my uh, various jobs in it for a few years now. Um, is it fair to say we have got a fantastic mix of businesses in Shropshire, from it, independents to sort of larger? It's amazing. I have to say, we're... Am I the luckiest? I, I genuinely think I have the best job in the world because we meet the most amazing group of people. If you think for the food festival, we've got 200 local food and drink mm. producers who are doing what they do best and are super passionate about it. What I love about Shropshire businesses is they're super passionate and can articulate why they love living here, why they love doing what they're doing. I think quite a lot of people who are working in in Shropshire are doing it because they truly believe it's the right thing to be doing. Yeah. There's not many people that are just here for a day job. Yeah. And that is the best reason to be doing business in Shropshire. There is no better place on earth. Lovely. And finally, uh, what next for Shropshire festivals? Um, What's coming up? I'm going to Spain on Saturday. Oh, very um, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully so, it's warmer than it is today. It is. We have got a whole lineup for this year. So um, we've got Food Festival in June. We've got obviously got Oktoberfest, which a lot of your listeners will know about. We've got a new event this year, which is Shropshire Petalfields. Um, and that will be over in Newport and that is all about those Instagram moments take a couple of hours out of your day to go and walk through some amazing flowers um, walking through some woods we've got big teepees it's all very getting back to nature and it's not been done before in Shropshire so we will do it first as ever <laughs> um, and we've got Open Gates Carnival we have got uh, we've got a new festival down in Ironbridge, um, which is a big 70s festival that we just got signed off yesterday. So you heard it here first. <laughs> and um, some other things that I can't remember that are on my thing. So if you go on to shopsfestivals.co.uk, you'll be able to see the whole lineup. And just finally, obviously, the um, event industry took quite a severe hit from the pandemic. Um, yep. Is it fair to say, you know, we're getting back to our back on our feet and it's getting back yeah. to where it was? Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I have to say, I would do it all over again. And the most people would think that an events company would be like, really, COVID, you do it all over again. We learned so many lessons through it. And actually, it got rid of a few people who thought that doing events was really easy, uh, which is always handy to have that because it ruins the market for all of us. So the events that have survived are the better events. Yeah. And so it has made going to events better for everybody because they're not you're not being saturated by people who think they can do it for a living and don't do it safely or very well. Um, so I would say that we had our most interesting year in 2021. That was brilliant because everybody hadn't been out for 18 months. Last year, was there was a lot of events that came back and popped up, but we did some new things. And then 2023 is looking pretty phenomenal. And the ticket sales are going really well, despite apparently a cost of living crisis, oh, which... I would like to believe, as ever in Shropshire, we don't seem to see it as badly as everybody else. So, fingers and toes, arms and legs crossed, <laughs> that people will keep buying tickets for all of the events. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you. Sorry, I do tend to chatter away. You make yourself. a perfect podcast guest. That's what the people we like. I'm James from Shrewsbury Food Hub. So, we're a food waste charity based in Shrewsbury. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we collect from uh, various different supermarkets every morning, yeah. seven days a week. Uh, and then we give out food to uh, various community groups or we have food shares, which is where anyone can come along and get food. We're entirely based about uh, food waste. So we're not, we're not a food bank. We do actually work with the Street Food Food Bank, yeah. but we are entirely about getting food eaten and not wasted because we're all about, you know, we want to work where you know, food is valued mm. and not thrown away. So that's what we're, we're really about. Um, so that kind of comes in two ways. Like I said, you know, we, we give out food to these various places and then we're also running our Taste Not Waste Challenge at the moment. Taste With No Waste Challenge at the moment. Yeah, um, obviously, we're in a cost of living crisis. I'm guessing demand for your services is greater than it's ever been. Uh, yeah, so we, we uh, as a kind of a, as a group, we originally set out to just kind of deal with food waste. But we, as we are, we are very community based. Yeah. So we help a lot of these different groups. So we work with things like, uh, or groups like the Samaritans, uh, The Ark, which is a, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, charity, a homeless charity in Shrewsbury. Uh, we save them about 50% of their food budget um, just by giving them our, our surplus food. Yeah. Um, the same thing with schools. You know, a lot of schools will have their breakfast clubs um, and you know, that particularly helps those students who are kind of, uh, who families may be in, in situations where they're struggling. Mm -hmm. But also we're trying to help people in general with yeah. reducing their costs. That's what a lot of our challenge is about is, as well, trying to reduce people's costs. So it's about educating people, like the everyday person at home who would normally chuck something away, you're saying, yeah. don't chuck that away, you can actually turn that into something. Yeah, so it's, it's all about um, kind of helping people 
we don't want people to change their lives massively. You know, mm. it's it, that's inconvenient for people. It's it's silly. I, w I wouldn't change my life massively. Mm. No, it's all meant to be things that are easy for people to do. Yeah. So um, the challenge. Uh, I'll just talk about the challenge specifically, mm. if that's right. So the taste with no waste challenge. What that is um, is it's all about uh, reducing food waste in the home, as I said before. But it's all meant to be things that are simple because the average family spend waste about seven hundred pounds a year on food that is wasted. Yeah. So what we've done is we made this challenge. It's five uh, videos sent to you by email featuring Steve the Hungry Eye, he's a local chef. He's um, stood behind me right now, actually. <laughs> um, and it's all small things to help you reduce food waste in the home. Yeah. So things like um, taking a shelving. So it's a really simple thing. Obviously, you know, you go to the supermarket with a list, don't you? Yeah. How often do you buy something off that list? That's uh, not on the list. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Well, when I go by myself, I'm very good, but when my wife comes along, it's a different story. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the list know, goes like that, yeah. You always <laughs> go on and you always end up getting things that extra. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, you know, it's human. We always do it. Yeah. I do it, you know, 95% of the time. <laughs> so the thing with the shelfie is that what we encourage people to do is to take a picture of their shelf and take a picture of their fridge before they go shopping and just bring that with them, as well as the list. So then, you know, say you see a great offer on, on mayonnaise, which is something supermarkets love to do. Yeah. And, you know, sauce is a big one for supermarkets. Yeah. So, so you see a great offer, you can check, you know, do I have this already? Mm -hmm. If not, great, you know, you can take advantage of the deal, get it. Another thing is um, we have our fridge board behind uh, with us today yeah. as well. And that, what that's all about is how do you organize your fridge? So, uh, DAF1, where do you keep uh, your milk? Okay, uh, milk in the fridge, yeah. In the fridge, yeah. yeah. In the door of the fridge. Yeah, door of the fridge. Where do you think the warmest part of the fridge is? Where is what? Where do you think the warmest part of the fridge is? Probably in the shelf. It's in the door. Oh, well, I didn't know that. There we go. So, um, we're just, it's simple things like, you know, rather than keep your milk, milk in the fridge door, don't be wrong, if it's opened, go for it, because mm. you're going to be drinking it yeah. actively. But if it's a, you know, maybe you've done a shop for your family or something like that, if you've got a second milk, stick it in the middle of the fridge, because that's the coldest part of the fridge. Oh, that's really interesting. Oh. So it's, I'll do that from now on, I will. It's a really good thing to yeah. do, because it, it keeps them lasting that little bit longer, yeah, so, yeah. you know, it, can save you a day or two, but yeah. that's a day or two of milk you'd have to Absolutely, buy Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You get to use it. Another thing, have you ever had like a half empty bag of salad leaves? Oh yeah, all the time. Yeah. yeah. There's a recipe in our challenge, turn it into salad leaf pesto. Okay. That's actually in one of the, the bruschetta, uh, the um, crostinis we have with us today. Yeah. Um, and what it is, is it's really simple. It's salad leaves, a bit of olive oil, salt, um, you can add uh, garlic as well. Yeah. All really, ingredients that most people have yeah, really, yeah. All ingredients, yeah. yeah. So really simple ingredients and you can just make it to a really nice pesto. Yeah, fantastic. So that's what our challenge is about. Um, it's all about trying to help save people money, mm -hmm. change, a few, change a few behaviors, but not massively. You yeah. know, we're not all about, you must do this. Yeah, because a lot of people don't like drastic you know, change today. Yeah. We're not trying to hit, you know, we're not trying to go for people who are, you know, we love people who are really committed to food waste, obviously. We're really committed to food yeah. waste, but we're trying to get to, to normal people. You know, yeah. average everyday people who, because people, people don't have time, especially at the yeah. moment with cost of living, yeah. they want things to be, they don't want to waste money, and things like this is to try and help people reduce yeah. that. Fantastic, lovely. So um, you can kind of access the challenge either through our kind of social medias or on our website, which is just uh, www.shootedfoodhub.org.uk. Fantastic. If you could start by introducing yourself and your business, that'd be great. Thank you. My name is Luke Crump. So I'm a solo artist, working, visual artist, working and living in Cheshire and Shropshire surrounding areas. Um, I sell my work via my website, lukecrump.com. Mm -hmm. uh, also via Instagram, I'm on there as luke.crump. <laughs> and I, uh, yeah, I'm here today at the Shropshire Business Festival. Uh, creating a large-scale format artwork of the event. Fantastic. Um, I've yeah. seen you busy at work in the corner there. So, yeah, exactly what are you doing then? Uh, so, I'm in the corner. Yes, I'm in the corner. It's a bit chilly, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, keeping warm by, yeah. Wandering around. <laughs> wandering around. Creating a big piece with uh, all the logos from the exhibitors here today. Wow, brilliant. And then kind of embellishing it with my, my own style. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's going okay. I'm about halfway through. Okay. So, I'd and can any business get their logo on there? Or? Any business yeah, can. All right, we'll have to try and get our Rouse Plus <laughs> yeah. one on as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's going great. So um, this is the, it's the first event that they they put on, and um, I'm hoping to also go to the the food festival in yeah. the summer. Um, but no, it's it's I've not had a chance to even see about 10 percent of today. No. There's a lot to see. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it. So your business, how did it start? Where I've always been into art, yeah. I've always drawn. 
as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. So my maths books are full of doodles and drawings. And um, I, I took it seriously. I suppose in the pandemic, um, I started to think, what do I want to do? And I was in retail, not really enjoying that. And mm. so I went to, and just set up a website, um, put more online, put my Instagram out there. And uh, yeah, it's, it's snowballed, to be honest. I've worked Fantastic. alongside uh, Adidas and Depop and Monster Energy. And um, yeah, the festivals are a great, great way of getting me out of the studio. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, meeting people and, yeah. you know, chatting with people like yourself. And yeah. you never know who you'll, you know, bump into. Absolutely. And, yeah. and do you do many events? Yeah, I've... I've done more like music festivals. Music so, festivals, yeah. Yeah, this is a bit more corporate, but yeah, of course, it's yeah. different. But uh, yeah, so uh, summer months are kind of quite jump packed full of different music festivals. And um, yeah, I do a similar thing there. So mm -hmm. just create a large scale piece of the event. Uh, normally raffle it off a charity afterwards yeah, um, to raise a bit, but uh, yeah. And what's sort of your favorite type of work that you do? My, uh, my favorite type of work are, I, I think, things on odd objects so oh, i've done okay. like gu guitars yeah. uh people's shoes yeah um mur murals are quite fun big things that yeah. you know get out in front of people um so yeah large things um but yeah that kind of thing and what sort of scale do you how big do you go um as big as i can <laughs> <laughs> as big as um, i'm allowed <laughs> yeah uh, i mean i work from home i can only get yeah. a certain scale but um, I'm hoping, I mean, I've talked with a lot of people today yeah. who've been interested in potential murals. Fantastic. Um, restaurateurs, people yeah, like that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's hopefully going to lead somewhere. So yeah. large scale pieces coming soon. Fingers Lovely. crossed. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank That's you. Great. Thanks for having me. My name's Stan Kay. The company we own is called The Creative Station Limited. We're a local company based in Condover, which is Shrewsbury. Okay, we've been trading now for roughly five years. Uh, we manufacture the retro gaming stations with a little bit of a twist. Absolutely. So we put them in an oil drum. We also put a fridge in them now as well, or you can put a display cabinet in them as well. Okay, uh, we got the design rights for all our products, thank God. Yeah, uh, and we... Uh, Basically, there's four of us involved in the company. Uh, it's a family-run business, and uh, we probably do about 20 shows a year throughout the country. Uh, we're just going from strength to strength. Uh, we can also bespokely make them, so if you've got a company and you want your logo put on it, we're the guys to come and see. Now, I've not seen anything like this before. Uh, where did the idea come from? Uh, basically, between myself and my son, uh, we have another business as well in the gaming industry, and we just knew that retro was a thing that was going to be big. So we put our heads together, and uh, he's the designer, uh, and, and he manufactures them as well, basically. So between us all, yeah. we come up with the idea after making four or five prototypes, yeah. and, uh, and here we are. Fantastic. Yeah. Here we are. So, uh, like I say, we, we travelled a length and breadth of the country, doing about, you know, about 20 shows a year, wow. uh, supplying everyone and anyone. So it's businesses, it's individuals, yeah, people having their yeah. homes? So it's anyone from yeah. Liverpool Football Club oh, wow. to Pirelli to Bilstein yeah. to, the, to, to the normal man who's just got a man cave. <laughs> Fantastic. And what's the most popular design, would you say? Uh, Probably, it depends what show we do. Yeah. If it's a car show, it's car related. Course, yeah, yeah. Um, if, it's, if it's a home build show, it can be anything from a union jack to just a champagne one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we do uh, two models. We do a model that carries 60 games on there. Yeah. And we do another model which has got 4,000 games. Wow, 4,000 games. So there's a little bit for everybody. Well, Jack, our cameraman, is uh, big into gaming, so this is right up your street, I bet, isn't it, Jack? Oh, yeah. yeah they're all retro ones, too. I really like that. Yeah, yeah. So, a little bit of Space Invaders there, to, to a little bit of Street Fighter on there. You name it, we got it. And what's the, sort of the plan for the business? Do you want to target Europe? We'll, the plan for the audience is basically worldwide. Yeah. Yeah, we're not saying we want to conquer the world, but but but, <laughs> we, nice but yeah, but we do want to. We, yeah. Obviously, we do want to expand. We we don't sit still. No. Uh, hence, we're bringing out new products all the time. The yeah. pizza oven's the new product. Yeah, yeah the, the beer pumps a new product. So yeah, it, we just keep growing and 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 expanding. Fantastic. And you're obviously at the Shropshire Business Festival today. Um, what yeah, what made you sort of sign up to come? Uh, basically. Beth asked us if we if we'd come along. Yeah. Uh, we thought it might be something a little a little twist that might be a little bit different for us. Yeah. Uh, and just seeing different people and yeah. basically see if we can you know, make some contacts and go from there. Fantastic. And what sort of the feedback you get from um, people looking? Cause... Oh, 
you know, absolutely. they've definitely got the wow factor yeah. when you look at them. I mean, every, everywhere we go, if, when we sell them, we always get people phone up and say, oh, my friend's just bought one, yeah. and we have one. Yeah. It, I mean, it's great. I mean, I mean, some of the people they do, like, like the feedback they do are right up for us as well. Yeah. It's a little editorial, so it's yeah, it, it works. Yeah, it works. And people can buy them online, can they? You can buy them online, yeah. yes, you can buy them at the show. Uh, Have you got a little business unit? We've got two business units in, in Condover Industrial Estate. Uh, more than welcome to come over there. We only manufacture from the units. So our shows that we do are our basically our rooms. Fantastic. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much.